This video will describe the self-consistent field procedure to solve for the optimal orbitals in Hartree-Fock theory. So here it is. We are finally arriving after who knows how many videos at the final result for the algorithm we use to determine the orbitals which represent the minimum energy orbitals for a given system in Hartree-Fock for a given atomic orbital basis set. Okay, so I'll say that to remind ourselves once more that we're basically using the variational principle to say, uh, given a set of basis functions, um, what are the orbitals I can form with that basis function, with those basis functions which have the lowest possible Hartree-Fock determinant energy? Because the orbitals with the lowest energy are the best approximation to the true orbitals of the system. And, all, and the orbitals with the lowest energy have the closest energy to the true energy of the system. So if any of that sounds confusing, please review the variational theorem from the quantum chemistry playlist. But otherwise, we'll be moving forward in describing how we go about solving this self-consistent field procedure. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is specify a molecule. So in quantum chemistry, a molecule is typically a set of nuclear coordinates. So we need x, y, and z coordinates for every nucleus you have, as well as what are the charges of those nucleus, of those nuclei, aka uh, what atomic identities do they have? Is it hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, etc.? So for all the nuclei, we need to know what nuclei they are and where they are. We also need to know what are all of the atomic orbital basis functions we're using. Uh, typically, there are stock specified ways of, of indicating that. Usually, for a given set of nuclei and coordinates, you pick a particular uh, basis set, which is a predefined set of atomic orbitals uh, corresponding to those atoms. And then additionally, how many electrons do we have? Um, in principle, you also have to specify how many spin up and spin down electrons you have. But for now, we're just assuming we're doing restricted Hartree-Fock where we have an even number of electrons and uh, all we need to specify is the total number of electrons. Okay, so that is our molecule. Um, so those things, um, basically, what, what nuclei do you have? Where are they? How many electrons you got? And what are your basis functions? That's all you need to do to specify a molecule. And then for that given molecule, there will exist a set of orbitals which have the minimum possible Hartree-Fock energy. All right, number two, calculate all the integrals. So various kinds of integrals we need between all of the basis functions we have. Between all pairs of basis functions, we need to calculate an overlap integral. We need to calculate a kinetic energy integral. Calculate a nuclear attraction integral for all nuclei. And we need to con compute... Um, we need to compute two electron integrals between all quartets of possible combinations of basis functions. So there's a quadratic number of these three. There's a quartic number of these. Th of these. Um, you can get away with a little bit of gains by exploiting the permutational symmetry of these electron of these integrals, but for the most part, the end of the fourth is unavoidable until you go to uh, fairly fancy methods. All right, number three, we're going to diagonalize our overlap matrix built out of the overlap integrals and obtain the transformation matrix X as defined in the orthogonalization video. All right, um, then step four is we are going to obtain a guess density matrix. So there are various ways of getting this guess density matrix. Uh, the most common way is what you call a core guess. Basically, you assume that the electrons don't interact with one another, that all of the two electron parts are zero, and then you solve for what the orbitals would be in that case. In the case where um, they're not interacting with one another, you actually can directly diagonalize and solve this eigenvalue problem. So um, the simplest way to get this guess density matrix is just to solve for all of the orbitals in the case where the electrons do not repel one another. Um, there are other fancier ways to get that guess, but uh, that's not the point of this video right now. <clears throat> Number five, we're going to calculate the G matrix. 
the G matrix uh, we note from the density matrix video is kind of the contraction of the density matrix with all of our two electron integrals. <coughs> Step six is we're going to calculate the Fock matrix. We're going to calculate that as the core matrix plus the G matrix. Core matrix being the sum of the T matrix and the V matrix. Um, the T matrix and the V matrix, once we calculate them, are not going to change on each iteration here, but the G matrix will. So note we have subscripts here, P0 being the initial density matrix, GI being the ith G matrix, FI uh, being the ith Fock matrix, but there's only one core matrix and that does not change. All right, step seven, uh, using our step seven, using our transformation matrix X, we're going to diagonalize the Fock matrix. F prime is X dagger F X. Uh, step eight is we are going to diagonalize F prime, or sorry, we're transforming the Fock matrix uh, using there. We're going to di then diagonalize F prime to get C prime, our transformed coefficient matrix, and epsilon, our orbital energy matrix, each of those specific to the iteration that we're on. Step nine is we're going to calculate our coefficient matrix by back transforming out from those transformed coefficient matrices. C equals X C prime that we got from the previous step. Step 10 is we're going to form the density matrix of the next iteration. So in step four, we obtain the initial density matrix by some guess procedure. In step 10, we get it from the new set of, uh, of, of coefficient matrices that we have, the new coefficient matrix. It gives us a new density matrix. And step 11 is to determine whether or not we're done. So basically, step 11 is to determine whether or not um, the density matrix for the I plus 1 iteration is si sufficiently similar to the density matrix for the ith iteration. So there are various metrics to do that, but basically determining whether the elements are close enough or not to one another to proceed. So if they are similar enough, then we go to step 12 and we're done. And if not, then we just increase the iteration number we're on and we go back to step number five. So basically, uh, if it's not close enough to the previous iteration, and we go back to step five, we calculate the new G from the new P, calculate the new F from the new G, calculate the new F prime from the new F, calculate the new C prime from the new F prime, calculate the new C from the new C prime, calculate the new P from the new C, and then see if the new P is the same as the old P. And we keep repeating and repeating and repeating until eventually, hopefully, this procedure has iterated to a point of self-consistency. So the name self-consistent field is basically saying that the density matrix, the field or the density of all of the electrons in the molecule, is sufficiently similar between iterations, i.e. self-consistent, that we are now iterated to the point where all of the orbitals are actually eigenfunctions or eigenvectors in this case of our Fock matrix. So once we have iterated to self-consistency, our orbitals are going to be eigenvectors of the Fock matrix and then the epsilon matrix is going to represent what those orbital energies are. Once we have satisfied the criteria for yes on step 11, we go to step 12 and that is use our final coefficient matrix, aka our final molecular orbitals, to calculate whatever properties we want. So the expectation values, those might include things like energy, um, those might include things like dipole moment, whatever kind of chemical or f physical property you have of interest for this system, you would calculate that using the C matrix, because as I've been saying here, the C matrix is the matrix of all of our molecular orbitals. And our molecular orbitals in aggregate represent the wave function of our system. And as we know from quantum mechanics postulate one, if we know the wave function of the system, we can use that wave function to calculate any observable property of the system. So the self-consistent field procedure, once we're done, we should have a, a wave function which we can use to calculate whatever properties we like. 
Of course, Hartree Fock is an approximation, so these properties aren't going to be exact, but they're going to be as good as the approximations we use to get them in this particular case. So one approximation is how close are we to the actual self-consistent density matrix. Uh, and then the other three are the approximations of hartree fock theory itself using the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, um, approximating using mean field approximation, and of course using a finite atomic orbital basis set.